And thank you to all our staff and for being with us today as well. So we'll call the meeting to order, our May 18th uh, Buncombe County Commission briefing meeting. Uh, commissioners, we're going to have an update on COVID-19 and vaccine efforts um, at our briefing meeting and have a detailed presentation on the uh, facility study that's been worked on this year. Commissioners, are there any other items uh, that you would like to bring up on the briefing at the briefing meeting today. 
All right, if not, then that is gonna be the agenda for this meeting. Are there any questions about any items on the five o'clock uh, meeting agenda today? Uh, Commissioner Edwards is gonna have an announcement under good news. So I just will, let's don't forget that when we get to that part. And we are gonna have a closed session to hear from uh, legal counsel following the um, completion of all the items on our agenda. So we will have a closed session tonight. I don't think we're gonna make any uh, decisions, but just to hear from counsel. All right, then let's proceed with staff updates. And the first one is the COVID-19 and vaccination updates. And Stacy Saunders is here to present this item. Thank you for being with us. All right, so I'll just start over, although I probably could have projected. Um, as of today, there have been 17,802 confirmed COVID-19 cases and within uh, Buncombe County, and we've experienced 315 COVID-related deaths in our community. When I reported to you all just two weeks ago, I indicated um, that we were seeing a potential dip in our new cases per 100,000 per week after several weeks of a plateau. And uh, we indeed did see a, down, a downward turn um, in that incidence rate, uh, with today's rate being at 47 cases per 100,000 per week. Yeah, a bit different um, than the last time I was here. And our new cases per day on average has dropped from about 30 new cases um, per day entering our public health workflow to about 16. We continue to see a steady decline in the percent positivity. Um, since my last visit, when the um, percent positivity was around 3.6%, today um, it's at 2.6%. And um, this indicator has been in the upper 2% for the uh, last few days now. The regional hospitalizations continue to remain low overall um, with a slight uptick uh, when looking at the entire 18 county region. Though when we look at our local hospitalization uh, metrics, they are still um, very low. And then um, our our metrics that we've been following over time show that downward trend um, that I was just mentioning. And just a reminder that these metrics are from Monday to Monday, so they don't include today's data that I just went over, but um, everything from yesterday. And so we saw our new cases per 100,000 um, per week fall below 50, um, which we had not seen in some time. And our percent positivity continues to fall, as you can see here. Um, our weekly testing numbers did decrease slightly after um, seeing an uptick. And we did experience one um, new death since the previous week. And as mentioned, our um, local hospitalization data remain, uh, remains quite, slow, quite low with um, a slight decrease from even last week. So you can see that that 2.2% is, is quite low. So um, finally saw our cells get out of that orange. <laughs> and um, now in that yellow zone um, for the new cases per 100,000 um, per week. And so since the beginning of our vaccination efforts, um, which began back in December, uh, Buncombe County HHS has administered over 90,000 doses of vaccine through those efforts. And with the efforts of all vaccine providers in Buncombe County, about 49% of our total population in Buncombe County has received at least one dose a vaccine compared to 41% of the total population um, in North Carolina. So please note that that's slightly different than what you hear the governor talk about when he talks about the um, percent of adult population. We still don't have that data to be able to grab from the dashboard um, to say that that adult population. Um, so North Carolina has achieved about 52% of its adult population receiving at least one dose. And so you can see us there out in the West, um, again, bold and, and um, darker and, and bright. 
And I wanted to share, when looking at the vaccination rates among, amongst the different age groups, we do see the highest rates of vaccination amongst our older population. And you've heard me say that, and you've, you've heard our state officials also say that. Almost 77% um, of those who are 75 years and older um, have received at least one dose. And we do have a very high compliance rate with second doses. And so that's why a lot of the default is receiving at least one dose. And equally, our 65 to 74 year olds are about 77% uh, as well. And we see that come down um, as we enter the 50 to 64 year olds, but still 56.3%. Um, and um, a little over 52% um, of those in 25 to 49 year old category. And then uh, we do see a decline as we enter the 18 to 24 um, age group at almost 41% um, having received at least one dose. And our youngest population um, being that 12 to 17, um, you know, I just want us to say that um, it has the lowest rate of receiving at least one vaccine. Um, but this is understandable, uh, as you all are probably aware that given that it was just last week that this group received the FDA extension for that EUA, that um, emergency use authorization for Pfizer to be used in 12 um, to 15 year olds with the subsequent ACIP and CDC recommendations and adoption of that um, recommendation. And so I'd like to note that when I was looking at this population last week, um, the state actually had it um, as zero to 17 in that age group and they've just recently changed it to 12 to 17 because um, zero to 11 is not, is not eligible. Um, so I'd like to note that when I just looked at this last week, we were only at about between five and 6% of that population. So in a week's time, jumped up about 13 percentage points. Um, and so I just wanna say to see that jump um, in just a matter of days is really a testament to those families and those caregivers who wanted to protect um, their loved ones and the community. And really a testament also to the vaccine providers across our county who quickly adapted to providing um, to a new um, age group being our teens and tweens. And so I'll take a moment and say, if you have not received your vaccine um, just yet, you know, now's the time to get ahead of summer camps, vacation and summer travel um, by getting your uh, teens and adolescents vaccinated now. And over time, um, our vaccine operations have changed and adapted um, to the changing supply, the demand and the needs. And uh, we did successfully consolidate the first and second dose sites beginning May 10th. Um, now first and second doses are available at our fixed site at AB Tech. And um, as you can see here, this slide has changed over time and you see a lot more outreach um, as we've shifted those gears. And we've increased our outreach efforts to meet people where they are, um, including events that are aimed at equity and reaching our younger unvaccinated populations, as you saw on the previous slide, um, that don't have rates quite as high as some of our other age groups. So we continue um, to vaccinate our homebound. We have um, three worksite vaccination efforts planned over the course of the next few weeks. In addition, We've conducted uh, multiple community outreach and um, events and have several planned in the next few weeks. We're averaging about one to two outreach um, every week. Um, just last week, we hosted events at Pisgah View and at Sandy Mush, and thank you, Commissioner Wells, for coming out to Sandy Mush Community Center to see that event. You actually see that one pictured here um, on the screen. We've had several events um, that we have planned in the next few weeks that include partnering with um, faith-based organizations like First Baptist and Weaverville and an event at Big Ivy um, and finishing up some planning for pop-up events at upcoming um, minor league baseball games. Again, in order to have that wider reach uh, into the population, we've begun um, discussions with even our local brewery associations and our restaurants um, and as outreach event demand has increased and we have events already scheduled for, for our team, we've also connected those partners with other state resources and vaccine providers who can meet their needs like StarMed um, in order to get vaccine out into these events. Um, 
So with the addition of the 12 to 15 year olds last week, we also met with the two, the two public school systems regarding potential vaccine events uh, with Asheville City Schools hosting an event this week, but very quick turnaround. Um, they were very excited to be able to host and they'll be um, hosting an event on May 22nd from nine to four that is open to the public. And um, as I mentioned, you can see that much of our work now is dedicated to outreach um, and outreach to our um, historically marginalized communities, outreach to younger populations not yet vaccinated. And the goal of the outreach is to increase access and ease of getting um, a vaccine. So we're planning them in uh, locations that are already um, visited uh, by individuals for other community events and incorporating recreation and fun activities um, like sports um, in order to um, it, uh, folks engage in the process. Overall, um, our metrics are, and so I, I just wanted to end with this slide and say that um, overall our metrics are, are looking very encouraging. Um, you know, our hard work as a community is certainly evident as we, as we see those uh, metrics change um, from our commitment to the three W's, compliance to the executive orders, and now with reaching um, throughout our county um, to get vaccine in arms. Um, but as we look at those metrics, I do want to remind folks that we are not all vaccinated yet. Um, and so as I wrap up this update, I do want to remind everyone um, who has not been uh, yet vaccinated to please do so. We have seen rates of our new cases decrease in our older populations um, because of their embracing of that vaccine. We want to see that same um, decrease in new cases um, over time with other groups um, and have them be just as protected. And until you do get your vaccine, we still recommend that you follow the three W's. Um, new cases and transmission data are low, but it is still very possible for you to, to be exposed and contract COVID-19. So please protect yourself with a vaccine um, and help us further rid our, um, our community of the virus. And so now that vaccine is available to anyone 12 and up, consider getting vaccinated um, as a family if you haven't done so already. Um, if you have already gotten vaccinated, we ask that you consider helping others get vaccinated and maybe that's providing a ride somewhere, uh, making appointments for folks who um, have not yet received their vaccine. And please visit uh, bunkumready.org to um, schedule an appointment with us or you can walk in at our AB Tech location, which is on Ferniehurst Drive during our hours of operation. Um, or you can find a location near you at myspot.nc.gov. Um, and just remember there is a vaccine for you. Um, thank you so much for your time today. <clears throat> thank you. Commissioners, are there any questions? Commissioners, I do want to point out the slide you showed that had the breakdown of how we've been vaccinated in our community with 20, 76% of the adults over 65 and 75. I think that's just a massive accomplishment. So I just want to say thank you. That that slide has been fantastic. It so is. Thank it you. is a huge con accomplishment and the period of time that it's happened is, hmm? is remarkable. So sure. it's terrific. If, if something if someone had told us back in December or January when the vaccines were being approved and we were also concerned about like, how is this all gonna play out on the ground? You know, never done this before to, to, if we had known then that we would be where we are right now, I think we would all have breathed a huge yeah. sigh of relief, even though there's still a great deal of work to be done. So great job, Stacy, to everyone on, on the team with Buncombe County and all the partners we have. Thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, it is a great team. Um, and so thank you very much for your support. You are a big part of the success as well. So thank you for that. All right. Great. I just want to add what an ease of experience it was to mm -hmm. take a teenager yesterday to the walk-in clinic <laughs> at AB Tech. I've never seen a kid so excited to get a needle stuck in his arm. <laughs> and I'm continuing to hear that throughout the county, not only from friends, but constituents who are incredibly grateful to have the walk-in clinic available for our 12 and older children too. Thank you so much for all that hard work. Glad to hear that. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up is discussion of the facility study, and uh, I think we've got several folks here to talk to us about this, and Michael Mace and Rachel Nilsson are going to get us started.
Thank you very much for having us here again. Um, we've got the pre presentation coming up here. Um, I'm Rachel Nilsson. Good to see you back after last month. And I also have Maureen Art with um, 720 Design. Uh, she has been working with us on the library portion of this master plan. So the focus of today will be primarily on the library update. And uh, we'll also dive into um, some deeper information following your feedback uh, from our, our meeting a month ago, specifically around Cox Avenue. So first, uh, today we'll review that library master planning and the analysis. We'll talk some libraries by the numbers, some of the cost information for the library specifically. Uh, we'll dive into those Cox Avenue opportunities following the feedback from last month, and then talk through some, any questions and next steps. So I'll let Maureen take it from here. Okay. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you for having us this afternoon. We are excited to share with you what we've learned about uh, the libraries during this nine month or so process. So we wanted to start off uh, by sharing with you a little bit about what we did at the very beginning in terms of community involvement. It was really important to uh, the library and to the consultants to dig as deep as we could into these really community-focused facilities to find out from the community what their hopes, their dreams, their expectations, and especially their needs were for uh, library services moving forward. So we did do uh, 13 focus groups. Uh, we did them virtually, and we were able to pull analytics from each of those focus groups uh, that we spoke to. Um, in general, um, the community rated the library facilities, and these are overall not specifically to any one library, but between fair and good in terms of the facilities. Um, how do they use the library? Most people uh, go there to check out books and to attend programs. And this was really important to us in looking at how space should be allocated moving forward, what percentage should be looking at the collection. Um, and some of your libraries don't have community meeting spaces, and so that told us how important that was. Um, and then what was the biggest thing that prevented people from using the existing facilities? And by far, the biggest reason people gave was parking. So related to kind of the accessibility of uh, the facilities as a whole. Um, we also asked the community what they thought would be a good partnership between county services and library services. And the three that uh, they identified as being most important were um, help for job seekers, so a place where people can go to fill out an application and learn about jobs online. Um, academic achievement, so that um, lifelong learning as well as a school age learning. And then senior services, so how do we um, assist those 65 and older with technology and, and materials. We also did an online community survey um, we had about 1,400 people across the county participate, um, and about 11% of those were uh, identified themselves as not users of the library. So that was great for us because we really want to hear from that group to find out what is it that the library can offer that um, will draw more of the population in to use the library. And then you can see from the chart there was a... a um, a pretty nice distribution, actually, of people from each of the libraries that they identified as their individual, um, the library that they use. From that, we are also able to look at the responses library to library. So different from the focus groups, um, we know what people that uh, identify PAC, for example, as their home library, what they had to say about that uh, building. So uh, when we started the process, meeting with the county, meeting with the library, we really identified uh, four drivers for, uh, for the facilities moving forward. The first being to really take a close look at the leased facilities. 
what is their physical condition, how does it function as a library, how are they serving the community, and what needs, what is the price tag on that to make them the most useful as possible. Um, and then second was looking at the overall condition of the facilities um, from infrastructure to um, finishes to furniture. Um, we also identified uh, the, um, the East Asheville Library construction, um, staffing issues, and staffing you'll hear me talk about um, a few other times during this presentation. One of the um, big points on staffing is that the library currently has about 51 hours every week where there's only one staff member in a given library, and that's um, both a, an efficiency problem but also a safety problem for, for library staff. Um, and then looking at uh, the drive time. Uh, you're in a unique county with, uh, we can't look as the crow flies, we have to look at the, the natural barriers for getting to library facilities. So we took that into consideration as well. And that's what this map uh, really starts to illustrate for us. We worked with your GIS department to look at what is the population served for each of the libraries. And so it's not a grid, it's really determined by some of those natural features that um, are beautiful but may pre prevent you from getting to the closest library that, as a crow flies. But in the top left corner, you can see um, the population served for each of the branches as they're currently located. That's really important for us because as library planners, we're looking at square footage per capita. And so we can take those population numbers um, and what GIS was able to provide us were actual numbers from 2010 from the last census. And we can look at what are the square footages per capita. The state of uh, North Carolina is silent in their standards on uh, the um, the size of the library per capita, but other states do speak to it. And so we looked at um, what most other states refer to as the ideal square footage per capita. And it ranges from 0.6 to being good, 0.8 being excellent, and one square foot per capita for being exemplary. And as a team, we set the 0.8 square foot per capita as the goal. And you can see from this chart overall, your library system is at 0.49 square feet per capita. And that was in 2010. So uh, in the 10 years of population growth, um, that number has certainly gone, gone down again. And then with the GIS map, we were able to look at each individual library and how they rank in terms of square footage per capita and where the biggest needs really are. So we looked at 2010, and then we looked at uh, 2020. So the population estimates not based on census numbers quite yet, but the county's comprehensive plan numbers. Um, and with some, the blue number, the black numbers are numbers where we're increasing the size of a library. With those increases in mind for between uh, 20 and 2020 and 2025, we can get up to that 0.8 square feet per capita. And then looking out 2035 for population increases, we can maintain that uh, 0.8 square feet per capita. And I'm gonna dig into each of those individual libraries further in, um, but we can refer back to these charts if we need to as questions come up. So the other thing that we did was we did a market segment analysis of the community. And uh, we used that information to draw this map of library users. And you can see color-coded where the library card holders are and who they listed as their home library. And you can see the colors are pretty well defined with uh, kind of a scattering of other colors throughout. But we could use that from uh, a drive time perspective. So we know where the, mm. we mapped where library card holders live. We can look at their drive times. Um, and we worked with GIS on these numbers as well. There's a lot of information on this slide, but this slide summarizes it. That point, only 0.2% exceed 30 minutes of driving to their closest library. 
2.4% um, drive between 20 and 30 minutes. And as a point of reference, your state standard calls out you shouldn't drive more than 20 minutes if you're an urban library or 30 minutes if you're a rural library. So you're in really good shape in terms of uh, the drive times and the locations for the existing buildings. So we were able to confirm that. As we were doing all of those upfront activities, we were also uh, visiting the library. So a team from CPL of uh, mechanical, electrical, plumbing engineers, civil engineers, um, architects, interior designers, and myself visited all of the libraries and filled out an Excel spreadsheet to rank the libraries in terms of their physical condition. So this is not about um, how it functions as a library um, in terms of its layout. It's not about um, the staffing. It's purely about the infrastructure of the building. And so of the 43 libraries that were evaluated by the team, um, over half of the 43 county buildings, over half of the libraries were in the bottom third of the ranking, um, including Swannanoa, which was 43 out of 43. So there's definitely some facilities, uh, challenges, and opportunities uh, to look at. I also want to point out that uh, three of the buildings that are in that bottom third are buildings that are leased by the county, so um, not in, in your control. Those are the leased facilities that we're looking really closely at. Um, East, the new East Branch that just opened is not part of this list because it wasn't available, uh, but I'm sure it would be number one. Um, were we to do that today. So based on uh, the walkthrough, we came up with um, a group of four just maintenance recommendations, and this is across the board for all of the libraries. Um, we noticed that um, interior and exterior signage um, is not consistent um, and is multi-layered and there's an opportunity for the library to come in as a system and come up with a standard signage package that could be utilized to help people find the building, to find collections as they, um, as they are using the library. Um, those libraries that aren't scheduled to re be replaced in the short term, we recommend that you go in with new carpeting. And then tied to that, because uh, when you replace carpet in a library, you're having to lift and move all of that shelving. And so that's an opportunity for you to look at space plans and uh, putting the shelving back in at a location that makes more sense today than it did perhaps in 1970 when the building was built and that shelving was originally replaced. Uh, it's also an opportunity to replace some of the, the shelving. Some of it is in um, pretty poor condition and not functional for 21st century collection. And then finally, uh, looking at uh, the service points that are in each of the libraries and coming up with a standard modular service desk. And then even for buildings that um, will be replaced, those are two things are things that can move with them, right? The collection is able to be moved, a modular service desk could be moved, so it'd be an investment today and an investment in the future as well. Um, back in January, we met with the library board and talked to them about um, a new way to look at organizing uh, the library system. So right now you have a, a lot of hubs that all circle around uh, PAC. And what we talked to them about was creating some new, bigger regional libraries that um, are spun off of technical services and administration. And then those regional libraries could support their own area libraries outside of the ring. And there are a bunch of reasons why that really makes sense for Buncombe County. Um, it starts to get these libraries integrated into larger communities. We can have more full service opportunities at each of those. There is less duplication of materials less duplication of staff, and that's really important for that staffing challenge that we talked about of how can we uh, redeploy staff to uh, help keep more than one staff person at any individual library. Um, 
The operations costs are lower, so fewer buildings, um, fewer to maintain, although uh, larger. Uh, we can start to look at eliminating or phasing out the lease spaces. And then it's an opportunity to plan for things like adequate parking, um, as well as possible co-location of other county um, departments at new library facilities, so where it makes sense to be a shared space. So we'd like to start by looking at the center at a new admin technical service outreach center, as well as um, a new PAC main library. And those two items may be, continue to be in the same location. They could also be separate. Uh, an administration technical services outreach center is more of a distribution center than a place for the public to go. So it is possible to look at those as two separate uh, buildings moving forward um, if that's what uh, the county and the library desire. So in terms of needs, and now I'm referring back to that, one of those very first charts that we saw, we're looking at a need for the PAC library to be um, about 65,000 square feet. Um, the existing building's 52, so it's a little bit bigger than uh, the existing. Um, the big challenge with PAC, of course, is parking, that um, parking isn't free. Um, people have to pay to park there, and if there's an event happening <coughs> in the event center, next door, then it's not possible to uh, park near the library. So that's the biggest challenge there. It is free for an hour, right? Is that correct? It's free for an hour, right? Free for the first hour. Yeah. Okay. You're right. Yeah, the proper stuff. No, I, thought, I, thought, I thought the parking garage is free to everyone for one hour. We have to the public. Is that true? If that was the case, did the city change it? No, but if it's an event, and if they're having an event, that's they charge the you. Yeah. But, but um, it's for day in, day out. The city has a first hour free policy in, in all the yeah. garages. Sure do. Yeah. yeah. Um, when we talked to the community about PAC, the, there were two things that they really love about uh, the. The building. The first, <coughs> excuse me, is um, the North Carolina room, the special collections area, and the second is the children's area. Um, so those are really important to continue to um, move forward with. Um, so we talked about uh, identifying uh, a new and still central location for PAC. Um, and it possibly a separate or a same location for admin and technical services. And then we're including outreach, and this is new for the library um, to expand in terms of uh, providing some additional services uh, like pop-up library services, vending, possibly bookmobile, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, further in. And then there's also an opportunity right now to look at library services in combination with affordable housing with some of the new potential funding that's coming out. So I'm going to roll right into that part of it to start with. Um, we worked with uh, your GIS department again to identify um, population incomes. And so on this map, the lighter the green, the more um, affordable housing is needed, so the lower the income. And you can see it really centers around uh, PAC and the city of Asheville. This map shows the library users that are in that same area, so there's a high density of library users around PAC. And then I've got a couple of case studies to share with you. Both of these are in Chicago. Um, Chicago, starting in 2016, started designing these combination library affordable housing um, combinations in their branches. Um, so these are two examples. Um, the first uh, being uh, this one that was built in 2019. It's a total of 65,000 square feet. The library is smaller. It's about 16,000 square feet. So. The city of Chicago actually has 80 branches, and they're all about 16,000 square feet, and so that's how their system is set up. Um, and then above the library are 22 senior living units, um, eight uh, 
on the second floor, on the third floor, eight more senior housing units and 14 affordable housing units. And so some of the benefits that they list um, on their website about these libraries are how efficient it is for the use of land. So you're stacking. Um, it provides affordable housing where it's most needed. Um, and then it starts to really create um, some community spaces. So the library shares some meeting spaces, some gallery spaces, some programming spaces with the community above. Um, there's outdoor spaces that are activated by the library as well. And then with the people that are living in these units, there's that opportunity for intergenerational programming and interaction as well. And then this is the second one, really similar, except this one is, has four floors and a little bit more, 44 housing units total. And then there's a third one that just opened and won an AIA ALA award, so for um, innovative use for libraries. So in addition to that, we, I wanted to share with you this project from uh, the City of Dallas Library Workforce Development Floor. So they're actually renovating an entire floor of their library for workforce development. It includes some collection, but it also has 11 group study rooms that are also consultation rooms, um, interview practice rooms, um, and places to meet, for example, um, maybe a homeless advocate or someone uh, who can uh, consult with individual library users about challenges and opportunities that they're having. There are also three high-tech um, classrooms on this floor that can be used for maker spaces. So, uh, and maker spaces in the sense of learning how to do robotics, learning how to um, use software, get certification, so to be able to send people out into the workforce. There's also two multi-purpose rooms and two kind of standard lecture classrooms on this floor as well. So it's a real opportunity to uh, tie what are traditional library services of technology, collections, to something that the community really needs. And then this last project is an example of a, a 65,000 square foot main library with a parking garage attached um, on an urban uh, site, takes up uh, one entire block. But it starts to look at some opportunities for creating plazas, for creating outdoor spaces. There's a roof garden on uh, the deck between the parking garage and the library and some outdoor reading spaces as well, which in this climate could be really nice. We also have an example of a remote uh, tech services admin outreach center. Um, so this is DeKalb County, Georgia. Uh, they have 23 branches, so a little bit bigger than you. And uh, this building is uh, bigger than what you would need. It's about 40,000 square feet. But it starts to show how that might work as a distribution center where um, trucks can make deliveries of materials that can be processed and then sent out to all of the branches. Administration located there, some training there for library staff and county staff as well. And then the last part of uh, the PAC and uh, outreach discussion is really about outreach. So we've uh, looked at the county uh, and drawn three mile radii around each of the existing branches. Um, three miles is a library rule of thumb for planning in terms of where people are willing to drive. Now, we talked about this at the very beginning of the three, three mile radius isn't exactly three miles here, but as a starting point to start to look at um, who's outside of those three mile um, radiuses. You can see from the map, the green dots all represent um, library card holders that are outside of that radius. And so from that, we could look at um, possible locations for um, non-traditional, non-bricks and mortar kinds of solutions north of Weaverville, in South Hominy and possibly um, at the Oakley branch as well. So this is a blow up of that, so you can see that a little bit uh, closer. And there are red circles around the locations that we're recommending. The 
this image starts to maybe explain to you what we're talking about, some of those outreach opportunities. Um, you've all probably seen a bookmobile, um, so that is pretty self-explanatory. There are other counties and cities that are looking at bookmobile opportunities as opportunities for um, not just the library, but for other county services as well. So um, get a permit, uh, register to vote, um, have Wi-Fi hotspots, have pop-up programs, all drawn out of a, a bookmobile. Um, and then on the bottom left is a book vending machine. So this vending machine allows you to either have a book delivered to that location that you've placed on hold. You can browse the catalog. You can, um, like the old sandwich machines where the books went around in a circle, you can browse that, use your library card, check a book out. And then the, the green Grand Prairie Libraries is a locker system, kind of like Amazon delivery system. So the, um, when you put a book on hold or a material on hold, uh, the library places it in the locker, gives you a code, you can pick it up 24 hours a day. So this works really well for those remote locations. It also works for people that have schedules outside of the library hours, so expanding that opportunity. Okay, we're headed out to the second ring of regional libraries. We've got some drive times for Oakley. The first one we want to talk about is Swannanoa and Black Mountain. These two branches are both leased um, facilities in your community. They're some of the smallest and they were some of the, um, the lowest ranked facility uh, analysis that we had. So some, some challenges with, with the building certainly. When we talked to the community about these buildings, um, they said three things in particular about Black Mountain, that it's too small for a growing community, that the parking isn't adequate, and there are uh, accessibility issues. So for example, the ADA restroom is on the other side of the community room, so if there is an event happening, someone who has accessibility issues actually has to go outside of the building and back in to use uh, the restroom. Who, who owns the buildings, or who owns the property? The property and the buildings uh, are, the Black Mountain is owned by the city, and Swatanoa is owned by the, uh, there's a community organization, I believe, that owns that one. Okay. So we don't, the count, Bookham County doesn't own them, but they're not, <clears throat> but they're controlled by public entities, right? Correct. So, I mean, I guess just the observation would be, if we wanted to have like long-term certainty around the use of those sites, if we wanted to keep them there rather than move them, you know, negotiating something like that very well might be possible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, but we also have the opportunity here to combine these two really small branches into one larger full service branch. That starts to solve some of the other challenges as well that that staff can also be combined so without adding more staff to the system, um, you can uh, increase the number of staff to that same building. The site, uh, both the sites are, are pretty tight, Black Mountain in particular. Um, but I think we haven't identified the ideal site for this combination library. And I think that's probably the next step to look at. Are there adjacent properties that are available? Can the city work with us to provide enough space to build a bigger building that better serves the needs of, of the community? The other really interesting um, uh, bit of data that we learned as we were looking at the market segment analysis, this map, the pink shows um, library card holders for Black Mountain. And the brown shows library card holders that say Swannanoa is their home library. And you can see from this map how many people in the Swannanoa region are already going to Black Mountain to use the library. So um, that's, that starts to speak to a, a combined library service as well. We don't have an answer as to why that's happening. Um, I think we can guess that uh, Black Mountain being downtown has other things that you can do 
once you get there, so it's more of a destination, although Swanano is in the park, and it's a, it's, it's a beautiful location if the building were um, in better condition. Um, and these are in order of the, um, the timeline, the loose timeline that we're talking about um, addressing each of these libraries. So Weaverville is the, the next one on the list of looking at this uh, replacement in two years. Weaverville has no dedicated parking spaces, and so, of course, that's the, the biggest challenge there. It is also, like Black Mountain, a walkable area, and kids um, from schools walk to that facility as we heard in uh, the online survey, which is, um, which is really great. It would be even better to have both opportunities for people to be able to drive to it and access uh, the library services. Um, it, do, it has a community room, but it's not easily usable. Um, it's in the basement and has a couple of columns that are right in the way of use. Um, there have been requests that uh, children's area be separated and a real need for group projects and group study rooms in those spaces. Uh, West Asheville Library is next on the list in about six years uh, with a replacement branch of about 25,000 square feet. Um, because that is out six years, there are some uh, maintenance issues to address there, um, including new carpet, plumbing, mechanical repairs, um, and uh, new shelving that could be reused in a, in a new facility. Um, Enka Candler was actually the, the highest ranked in terms of the facilities because it's one of the, the newest. It also serves one of the largest populations. And so that's one that um, will need to be either enlarged or replaced um, in the next seven years or so. There are just a couple of little um, issues and challenges that they're having there with electrical work, um, their service desk, and uh, a real need for a drive-up service window in that location. Uh, Skyland and South Buncombe, looking at expanding that or perhaps co-locating with um, the schools for a new 20,000 square foot library. This is a really busy library, especially after school. Um, Teens go there in, in droves to do their homework, to socialize, um, and that is great with the library. They're happy to see all of those uh, library users show up for the facility. Um, but they're in the community room now. They're overflowing into the rest of the library, and so um, there is a, a real space crunch there for them. And then East, which opened on May 1st. Congratulations on that. Um, that is uh, really exciting for the system and the opportunity to um, really set the bar for the library branches moving forward. This branch is about 14,000 square feet that just opened, and so it would be a good one to go look at and think about in terms of if it were 50% larger for some of the new regional branches that we're talking about, um, what kind of library service could be provided. And then finally, what we've talked about with uh, Oakley is really keeping an eye on what happens at East. A lot of the library users that live in the Oakley area actually drive to East or to PAC right now. And so with that new facility, we want to really track um, what services look like, what circulation looks like. Um, we do know that um, Oakley is a really popular location to pick up materials. So uh, keeping that as one of the uh, lockers or vending area, as well as a center for outreach. So we did hear from, for example, the Shiloh community. They'd really like a library service close to them. And so that opportunity for outreach to do a pop-up library program at their community center, uh, maybe story time Saturday morning, maybe homework help. Tuesday afternoon on a regular basis that really expands that, uh, that outreach. Um, Oakley is um, among those bottom uh, third of the facility condition. There aren't places for people to sit. There's not a community room. Um, and 
I believe there's only one outlet in there for people who bring their own computer to, to be able to plug in. So there are some major facility challenges. And again, it's a leased space, so not, not county controlled. Leased from the city of Asheville? I believe that's true. Yes. <clears throat> so this is, uh, again, a blow up of um, the market segment analysis, and I'm gonna to go to the next slide, because on this one, it, it shows you um, from the market segment analysis, people within one mile, 59% of them chose to use Oakley, 40%, 41% chose to use another library, and it's typically East or PAC. Uh, when you get to that three mile radius rule of thumb, 22% um, of uh, market, the market segment users said that um, they chose Oakley and the other 78% choose another library. And so people are making that choice already. And again, um, by turning this into a vending outreach location, it allows that staff to be redeployed perhaps to east where services are picking up and circulation is picking up. Okay, we're gonna go out to the third ring, the area libraries, and the vending locations we've discussed already. So now we're getting out um, to the 10 years and beyond the, the scope of the facilities master plan, um, starting with uh, the Lester Library. Um, it'll be the first one that uh, needs an addition of about 8,000 square feet. Um, Lester is really lucky. They're on a really great piece of property. There's a lot of space around it, and uh, I know the library staff has been coming up with plans to really, really utilize that space for things like community gardens, outdoor amphitheaters, outdoor activities, and so expanding in a short term that space by using the, the outdoor space. And in the long term, they will need additional space for sure. Um, Fairview. Um, outside of the scope of the study is when they'll need um, some additional space. Um, there is some space outdoors at Fairview that could be better utilized with a little bit of um, grading work, maybe security work. It's on a pretty steeply sloped site, um, but there is a possibility for integrating some outdoor reading gardens, some outdoor programming spaces, um, and some small reconfigurations to the inside. Um, the, their library users have changed over the years. They have more computers than they need um, and less programming space. And so by recarpeting, by reconfiguring, um, perhaps putting in a movable wall or a garage door at the community room that opens into the library space, there's an opportunity to um, better fit the needs of the community today. Um, North Asheville also outside of the, the timeline, um, but one of the, the newer branches, again, this one, um, at some point will need to double in size. There's some parking challenges there with its relationship to um, the retail environment. Uh, Recarpeting is, um, is really needed sooner than later there. The carpet is um, kind of rolling and it's becoming a, a safety challenge. Um, and that'll give you the opportunity to rearrange the shelving. It's on an angle. Can we straighten it out and fit a little bit more into that building to um, get you through the next 10 or 15 years? So we talked about all of the projects in terms of the timeline. This is the timeline that we've been looking at um, with the possibility of uh, the PAC library maybe moving up in the timeline if some of that new funding and affordable housing opportunities um, are desirable to, to you all and to the library. Questions? I've got a few questions. You guys can hear me. Go ahead, Parker. had West Asheville in worse condition than, than Weaverville. So I wanted to understand that. And I'll go ahead and ask my second question. 
which is, and maybe I missed this when you were discussing PAC library, is it still your recommendation that PAC library um, get relocated and rebuilt in the downtown area? Or, or do, you, do you kind of specify recommendations on, on its location? So I'll address the first last question first. Um, Rachel with CPL is going to talk a little bit about our ideas for where PAC might go still in the downtown area. We've been exploring an area um, on uh, Cox Avenue that, as a possibility for relocation of PAC. And then in terms of um, the, the order of Weaverville versus um, West Asheville, I think uh, the, the big thing was a potential site had been identified for Weaverville. And so that's why it was further up on the timeline. But of course, these are all based on when funding becomes available, when sites become available, um, and certainly not in stone at, at this point. And I'll just have a question or a comment on the, um, when you're talking about the vending locker services, mm -hmm. I have to admit, I just really can't kind of quite understand that from a library perspective of wanting to go out. I just really don't, not sure that I see those being utilized. But I do think your idea of the pop-up in the community centers in Shiloh, in the, um, out, you mentioned Barnersville, Big Ivy mm -hmm. has a community center. Those type of places, maybe the pop-ups could work and the, potentially there. That seems, whenever I go to our libraries, I see them being used as this community hub too, not just a place where you just go and grab the book. Absolutely, and that's true across the country of a library being really that community hub, a place to create information, not just take it home with you. And we do wanna foster that for sure. Um, but in places that maybe need a little easier for somebody else, a locker might be, uh, might be a good idea. And my other question, I'll just say, we're getting lots of emails about the Black Mountain in Swannanoa. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'd like to hear more about that because we've even heard from the Black Mountain Chamber of Commerce. It seems pretty clear that we're getting a lot of community outreach with concerns about that. And they bring up the fact that they, they like they're able to walk to it, mm -hmm. um, that it is a community hub. And so I'm, I'm interested in hearing more about that specific recommendation. And I'm sure commissioners who actually live in that district probably have some more to say as well. Absolutely. I mean, as an architect, that mid-century building is very, it's very cool, it's very welcoming. Um, I agree, when I visited that library, I walked it. Um, and then went across the street, there's a great Thai restaurant, I had lunch. And so f even for me as um, a visiting consultant, it's a, a lovely place for a library, absolutely. Um, and I, I don't know where the right location is for it moving forward, but there are some really big challenges with, uh, with it at the moment. The first, it's not owned by the county, and so the, um, the maintenance the challenges for it being a functional library are, are great. Um, and the site isn't big enough to support the parking and the size building that um, a community of that size really needs. Now, is there a location somewhere in Black, in Black Mountain that we could do a two-story, 20,000-square-foot building with 60 or 80 parking spaces? I don't know the answer to that. Um, if there is, that, that would be the most obvious and fabulous answer because uh, that's what the community really needs. And I love that um, they're so attached to the library. That's the library's goal in every community, right? To be that community hub, to be the gathering place, to be the place where you go to, to, to meet your neighbors and to be able to walk to it and then walk to a restaurant or um, walk to a store is, is awesome. So I understand where they're coming from. We're just, we're constrained by the size of that site. But doesn't that almost kind of preclude having these libraries in kind of your traditional downtowns, right? I mean, because you're kind of talking about sort of a more suburban 
model of you know building surrounded by a big parking lot. I mean, you're not going to find that in downtown Black Mountain, mm -hmm. I don't think, or cost you know ten million dollars to buy the land if it does exist. Right. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I understand the desirability of having kind of dedicated parking, but I mean, all the businesses in downtown don't have dedicated parking. But that's it's a beautiful traditional downtown where mm -hmm. it all kind of works anyway. Mm -hmm. So I guess I just have a concern about sort of the model sort of precluding, you know, downtown Weaverville, downtown Black Mountain as continuing to be good locations for these libraries. Well, parking was the biggest barrier to use for the libraries as a whole. And Black Mountain in particular had three pages of comments from the community of, there's not, it, 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 they all address three things, parking, accessibility, and the size of the building. And the community's right about those three things. And so that's the challenge. Do we, how do we meet those needs for library services and still keep it in a location that is accessible to downtown and, and walkable and make it, make it continue to be that community hub and central meeting point that, that it is, but to the size that's appropriate for that community. Yeah, I think that's where it's going to be really important to make sure that we're widely sharing the results of those surveys. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not surprised to hear those things, but based on the emails that we received, I'm, I'm beginning to think that there were a lot of very passionate library users who didn't participate <coughs> in those focus areas. And maybe had they known about it, had better opportunity to access it, I don't know what the challenge was, um, we might have had some some different responses mm -hmm. to that. So I do want to be really cognizant that it's going to be highly important that we widely share that information. As I listen to, you know, you talk about the number of teens that walk to the libraries after school, how it becomes a central central place for, you know, homework. It also makes me think about one of the reasons I think we were so excited about the East Asheville Library is the opportunity for outdoor recreation and learning by being outside. And for me, that expands into how we can better engage our teens in our libraries. I know I walked to my library a lot as a teenager growing up in a small town and how important that was um, to shaping my academics and my love of the library. So I don't wanna forget as we move forward how key the library can be to not only to our little kids, but our teenagers as they, as they grow up. I think that's such a, a neat component of being in a you know a small town where you have that access. It does make me think though, and I'm probably gonna have a lot more to say. I get really excited about the libraries, y'all. Mm -hmm. But Commissioner Walls, I loved your point about the vending that I actually was really excited over here. I was like, vending libraries, that's so cool. <laughs> um, but it does make me think that there is a place for those, particularly where parking is a challenge. Um, to access the library, it's busy. You have that opportunity just to run in and push in your code and out comes a book, which is really exciting. I want to go do that right now. Um, but it may increase access to to reading for folks, um, particularly those of us you know who are working really long days and can't always access the library, you know, on a Monday through Friday or even a Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. So I think there's some really exciting components of this that I look forward to seeing how we can put into action to increase access to learning for residents of Buncombe County. Mm -hmm. And the lockers and the vending are something, you could do a test one, just put one out there and see how it works. And if it, if it works, then put in the other two, but do it, run a test first to see. You know, I like <clears throat> what I see, but one of the questions I have, and I don't know if you can even address this, at this point, but how much will this cost? Rachel is prepared to address that. <laughs> um, I've got that on the next uh, next series of slides, so oh, okay. I can that now or um, if why don't we why don't we get through the slides yeah, and then we'll yeah, we'll fine. come back we'll come back to that if you got it next that's fine okay. Yeah. that shows the Swannanoa users of the Black Mountain Library. Um, I think we're thinking about this, you know, if you go back to slide 29 that has all the hubs, 
Um, I think we're all assuming you're recommending that we put the larger regional hub in, in Black Mountain and have the smaller branch in Swannanoa. And I, I, I guess I'm looking at that map on, on slide 31 of, of, yeah, that map right there. Mm -hmm. Looking at that map, I'm wondering if the larger, newer branch could theoretically be put, placed in Swannanoa and then have a smaller um, hub or whatever word it is you're using um, in, in Black Mountain. I, didn't know what your thoughts were on that. That's some, not something we explored quite yet, but it's definitely worth uh, reviewing and understanding. The population of Black Mountain is bigger than Swannanoa, um, and people are driving from Swannanoa to Black Mountain now. Um, but I, yeah, we'd have to look at how we think that might change if the bigger library were um, in Swannanoa. Could you, could you clarify, I may, have missed, I may not have heard this correctly, I thought the proposal was to um, have a bigger library in Black Mountain and to close the Swannanoa Library. That's correct. So not to have two, but just only have one. Correct. Well, yeah. Okay. Other questions or comments? Just very briefly, I, I, um, there's a lot about this process that, that really appeals to me because it feels like it's asking the question of how we best serve the needs of our community and how libraries evolve. And, and I think the East Asheville Library is a really sterling example of what that looks like. And at the same time, I'm also just, you know, hearing from many, many community members um, at a very emotional level. It reminds me of the conversations about potentially closing schools or churches, you know, that, that libraries play this other role in our community. Um, that's just that, that um, it's not about nostalgia, it's about sort of a rootedness and a sense of community. Um, and, and I think that as we move forward, it feels like, um, I, I don't know, I mean, I guess I'd be interested maybe in, in what it would look like to play out some scenarios where there were some remodelings. Some of these maybe were remodeled. Um, if we found a, a, a municipal par or a leasing partner that was open to that kind of thing and, and just kind of thought about a library system that maybe spoke to um, that piece of it as well. I, I don't know if that... Um, I'm not an architect or designer. I don't know what that would mean at a functional level. It feels like this is pushing the whole system in that direction, which maybe is, is where we need to land. But I just wonder about that other piece, about the um, that other function that library plays. You're an architect. You could probably speak to that very eloquently. I know that's something you all think about a lot. But I've, what I'm hearing from community members is, is something that's really important in, in, in our community that, that we find ways to sort of recognize and preserve those places that have hold that meaning for people. So I just want to make sure that as we move forward in this, even as there's a lot that's very exciting to contemplate, um, that we're not losing sight of that piece that um, with so much changing in our community so fast that there's something special here that I wouldn't want us to lose as we move forward. Yeah, it is a very emotional decision around libraries, and I see that in a lot of communities. Um, and that's really kudos to the library and the library staff to have really built those relationships over time. And, and certainly, anything that you do moving forward really needs to support and build that up. And really, I should have said this at the very beginning, that all of these recommendations are built really around the condition of the facilities. The staff at uh, Buncombe County Libraries is really amazing. I mean, they've done um, a shocking number of programs and um, community outreach with, um, with the resources that they have. And so we're, the hope is that this plan brings the facilities up to meet the staff where they are to help support all of those activities that make it so beloved because I'm not sure it's so much the buildings that people are attached to, in some cases maybe, um, but it's really that feeling of, uh, and we heard this in the online survey, uh, the library staff feels like family. They're always there to answer my questions. Whenever I need help, the library staff is there for me. So I want to make sure that all of this is related to bringing these facilities up to, to meet the quality of the staff. Thank you. And so now we're going to go down to and look at the, that, those properties some more. Just one other just comment I would make. I mean, I appreciate the um, the creativity in terms of thinking about like mixed use of property in some cases, and you know, residential and libraries and things like that. Um, I mean, it looks it looks 
cool doing it that way. And of course, there's a huge housing need in the community. But you know, um, I would also just sort of, on the other hand, kind of say, you know, the, um, the more elements you add to these projects, of course, the more complicated they get too, right? Like doing affordable housing is complicated. You know, um, these projects, the way they're incentivized by the national policies and stuff, um, tax credits, um, you know, it's in some ways, you know, doing a library, I mean, we worked on the East Asheville Library for years and years, it turned out fantastic. I think mm -hmm. we're so excited about it. Um, and, but it took years and years. And, um, and then doing, you know, every, every one of these, you know, bigger housing projects that we work on, we see how complicated they are. Trying to do them together, of course, just makes it more complicated too. So mm -hmm. just to kind of say, you know, I think that it's certainly something we should be open to and try to think about best use of properties. But um, in some cases, kind of keeping things simpler, there's, there's good arguments for that, um, that as well. I mean, and just, you know, um, thinking about like if you did, like in some cases, if you needed to add a parking garage to a project to do both, well, that might, you know, double the cost of the project, you know, as opposed to just a library with some parking around it. So mm -hmm. just to say, I guess, you know, um, we should be open and I appreciate the creativity, but in some cases, you know, the simpler solutions for housing and libraries might make sense, you know, they're not, they, might, they won't all make sense on, on every, on every property. So that's, that's definitely correct. And just looking at, and I think somebody complimented GIS. They've been a great partner in this. Um, I could call them with any question. They could help us map it. But that GIS map of show, that shows where it's really needed really is kind of the center core. So um, I, I'm not sure that um, we were recommending it outside of PAC, but. Um, okay. Well, let's move on and look at the downtown properties, and uh, it's got some library components potentially to it as well. So let's look at let's look at the Cox Avenue properties. And um, and before we dive into the Cox Avenue, I'll just touch back on on your question in regards to cost. And what we um, have done with, um, so I just wanted to um, bring it back. These are a couple of slides that we showed um, last month. Um, again, looking at maintenance, we talked about maintenance costs of those facilities over the next 15 years. So I've just highlighted, um, again, that also includes some of that escalation costs. Um, overlaying uh, those three that are leased facilities. Um, and then here is the, the question on some of these, like what they would be kind of capital projects. Um, these are costs that assume um, uh, AV, FF and E soft costs included. So these are not just construction costs and they are escalated to the timeline that we're showing um, with the understanding that um, this is a recommendation. There is nothing set in stone on this timeline at all, and that it is as funding and in some cases as properties become available. Um, moving on to the Cox Avenue opportunities. Um, at our last discussion, we talked about, um, we, we looked at the kind of Com uh, the number of properties that this that the county owns um, really within a pretty small area um, couple block area on Cox Avenue focusing primarily on um, 50 Cox Avenue two Sawyer uh, no sorry one Ravenscroft and 52 Cox Avenue um, two of those properties have current buildings on them so again 50 Cox Avenue has the Board of Elections uh, distribution and one, uh, 52 Cox Avenue has that small um, 3,000 square foot building which has air quality and some HHS admin. We discussed um, that relocation, um, potential relocation uh, previously. So again, looking at those, um, talking about um, a new board of elections facility because of the um, pretty fairly urgent need for um, relocating that staff um, out of the current leased facility on 77 McDowell. And then um, what opportunities there are here on Cox Avenue um, in order to kind of build something to a little bit bigger scale than just a 10,000 square foot, one or two story building. 
the first thing we did is we looked at uh, we we actually looked at both properties. We looked at that um, that property where the the distribution center is, um, with understanding that that might not be the right location for what is a distribution center and a storage, um, as opposed to being a site where people regularly uh, the public regularly comes. So that um, site that uh, building. Um, and those uses could be um, relocated elsewhere outside of the downtown area with that property potentially becoming available for other opportunities. And so in terms of just a square footage conversion, uh, that particular property where the distribution center is is about 21,000 square feet. Um, if you were to use the entirety of the property, 42,000 is that larger one. And we were assuming uh, zero setbacks along streetscapes. So I've got four options here that kind of show some um, massing um, and potential opportunities of programs that can be located here. We looked um, specifically at um, parking at a um, large, basically a pack relocation. Uh, we looked at affordable housing. We looked at library tech services, and we looked at Board of Elections. So those are the five programs that are included and in really every single one of these four options, um, just to show you kind of the extent that's possible. Again, none of these um, are specific recommendations, um, just trying to show you um, what the options are based on zoning of this area. So in this first option, um, there is a uh, Library Services Board of Elections at that distribution center site, that yellow and green on the plan view with some surface parking. And then um, at the longer site, uh, there is a parking structure, three-story library, and uh, multi-story residential. And so um, we've actually done the analysis of how many units that equals um, at this site and how many parking spaces that equals at this site. So in a pretty much every single one of these, we're looking at about 360 parking spaces out of that parking structure. We're looking about 112 housing units. Um, that could be a combination of market rate and affordable housing. Um, and we are looking at a uh, about 63,000 square foot library. Um, 20,000 is kind of the minimum floor plate that um, makes sense for a library of this scale. Um, so we're looking at three stories of that 21,000, some workforce development spaces, um, board of elections, the 10,000 library services with some surface parking. On the second option, um, the 52 Cox Avenue site contains workforce development and library with a possible or optional pedestrian connector across uh, Sawyer Street, uh, which is not a key pedestrian street in terms of uh, city zoning. And um, with the library, remainder of the library, the parking structure and the residential being located on that longer site. Um, the, the downside to this particular model is that separation of the library across two different properties. Um, it can be handled with uh, different library services in different areas, um, but it's probably preferred to keep it all at, at one site. And again, we're still looking at, uh, this one has about 120 um, residential units, but other than that, we're really still looking at the same um, size spaces and the same quantities of spaces. On the third option, um, the parking, that 52 Cox Avenue site is parking um, with residential. So that's that taller tower that you see. And at the long site, that is the library, the tech services, and board of elections with, again, with all that parking um, being under that residential. Um, again, same amount of parking, same amount of uh, residential units and same square footage of library. And in the fourth option, we looked at um, how these different uses come together if that 52 Cox Avenue site is not utilized as part of this. And again, that could stay distribution center, that could be used um, in the future for any other um, projects, um, but this puts all of those same programs all on the one site and goes a little bit more vertical in order to accommodate that. Uh, 
Um, any questions on those four options there? I know that there's a lot to look at. And <laughs> Um, it looks like it's repeated a couple other places, but I wanted to confirm what ground level habitable area meant. <laughs> and then, um, the quantity of parking spaces, how that was calculated. It, it's just, um, there's just a tremendous amount of parking in this area of downtown already. And so I, I just, just disappointed when that, when we, create more of it so just wanted to find out how that was calculated mm -hmm. so um with the habitable area that's a zoning requirement that their parking deck cannot be located right on a key pedestrian street which cox avenue is so there has to be a two-story space right along that key pedestrian street that is uh not parking that can be um, county services that could be retail that could be other um, uses it's just not parking um, and it not necessarily housing or it wouldn't be housing i should say in terms of habitable um, in in terms of the parking structure um, we're looking at about 120 residential units so um, if if um, there was one vehicle space assigned to each residential unit. Uh, then you're left with that 240 spaces that can be used for um, for county staff. It can be used for visitors. It could be used for um, other events, things like that. And so we were just targeting that 360 um, as uh, kind of what was possible in that area. Um, but if there was a strong desire to reduce that number we would just look at it in terms of what services are being offered and then what's um, the, the best ratio of um, service staff residential to, to parking this may not be this this probably was not your job to look at this so um but and it's maybe it's you know i know it's up the street um one thing that, that just to kind of parker's point there's a lot of parking in this general part of downtown um, I'd be interested in seeing how the county's parking garage up the street um, is utilized. Um, whenever I'm over there, it's got enormous capacity. Um, so, and again, I realize it's not right here. So for, you know, for certain uses, that's, you know, maybe not directly relevant, but I, if it'd be possible to just share that information on <clears throat> like the daily utilization of that deck. Are you talking about Cox, the, the HHS Behind one? the new HHS building. Which I think is um, spaces are leased out by a third party. It's, it's managed by a third party, yeah. Great. All right, any other questions? And did you have more on your presentation or were you? Uh, no, nope, that was it. I... Um, we have pulled together the, um, the non-library and the library projects on this one. Um, and then um, just kind of next steps, what we talked about last month too, was um, trying to bring together that kind of final presentation for you in June um, and anything else you'd like to see um, bringing, wrapping that up um, to make sure that you have all of this information that you may need for any of your other budget discussions. And the, the idea was to, maybe temporarily utilize the metal building, the blue metal building for election services in the short term, if we could, if we could move there and then, and then it might get demolished and something new get built on that property, but to use it in the interim as it can be. Yes. That's still thought. They're still, they're located there now. Okay. Uh, they've moved out of 77 McDowell and they're physically located there now. Okay. Okay. I just have a couple other maybe just comments. Um, the, um, I mean, I, th I think there's there's a lot to think about here. So this is good. This is exactly the kind of you know kind of briefing meetings are a great, great place to kind of put all this out. Um, you know, I think there's like in in a way I kind of like although I have a lot of questions about different spe specific pieces. I mean, in a way I also just I kind of like the whole thing. I mean, I think there's a lot of logic to it. If you were building something from scratch, it would probably look like exactly like this. But of course, you know, we're not building it from scratch. We've got all the stuff that it, as it exists in the world today. And um, 
so, um, you know, and just in different parts, I mean, part of it just kind of goes to this question of what elements, you know, uh, do we want to have kind of built into the library, the library pieces? I mean, having the community space is great, uh, of course, but there's also a lot of other community spaces in the community. There's, you know, libraries are not the only place to do that. Um, I think the workforce development um, stuff is um, interesting. Um, but I also know that like AB Tech is really interested in doing some kind of center at AB Tech around, you know, kind of a place for people to come for workforce development. So it's like, is, is the library the best place to put that or is creating some kind of new kind of one-stop place at the AB Tech campus the right place to do it? So I think there's just a lot to think through on all of this, but I appreciate the presentation and um, I think it's going to, you know, create a lot of good conversations around all those different, um, all those different pieces. Um, so, any other comments or questions at this time? All right. I just say, Avril, can you just kind of share with us some of your thoughts on next steps in this? <clears throat> I think next steps, we would bring this back because, as a briefing, they're not looking for the discussion or did, we're looking for discussion but not decisions. So, we really wanted to get your feedback of what that final report will look like. Um, when we came before you last time, we thought regional was where we were headed, but now we've got some feedback and lots of community dissent, I guess I would say, from the briefing that we had with the library board. So our plan would be to go back and come to you with a final report, including all that feedback on your June, um, was it the June 2nd? 15th? 15th? The June 15th meeting. So this gives us time to go back and really refine our input and give you a final report. Um, we will be looking from that final report for what, where do we go next? Mm -hmm. What do we build into our capital plan for the next couple of years? Mm -hmm. This is a 15-year plan, so we know that we can't accomplish all on the list. And we don't know what parts of this we could use from that money that is coming as well. So, right. so our plan would be to bring you back a final report on that June 15th, see what parts you want us to move forward with, and then plan it out in the next couple of years where we would go from there. Thanks, that's helpful. I, I guess just at the high level in terms of response to the various options for Cox Avenue, I, I would be interested in whether there's some opportunities to sort of include any elements that might sort of um, make this a little bit more of a hub or like um, there's certainly a lot of important function. The library will be attracting a lot of people, housing would, but like there's not a place downtown to buy groceries, for instance, um, uh, or, you know, and just thinking about elements like that, that like might just sort of speak to some of the, um, I don't know, it just, it, I guess I'll leave it there. So, some other pieces to that development project that might kind of um, draw people in, but also speak to some of the needs that we know exist, especially for people who are using the public transit system, um, who might be using services at the library, who might be attracted to, or who might be in affordable housing um, some of the brainstorm ideas we talked about were grocery store, early childhood center. Um, you know, I think the workforce development piece is getting to that a bit, but I would be excited since we're in this unique place where we're kind of at this brainstorming stage, I'd be excited to crack it open a little bit more and maybe see what other ideas could, could be in the mix. Yeah, I would, I would, I would, um, I would kind of echo that because I mean, part of what makes it so unique is that it is literally across the street from the single largest public transit hub in Western North Carolina, right? So if you think about the question of what facilities and services um, would you want to have within a single transit ride for like every single person in Buncombe County who is, you know, uh, lives close to a transit route, like if you put it there, then you put it, you put that within like a single, you know, no, no transfers needed for every single person in the community. So yeah, like, you know, a grocery store uh, or, or market, things like that. Those are, I think those are all good questions to to think about, they probably don't all have to be decided at every level of detail at this stage, because if we move forward, I'm sure there'll be more, there would be more individualized planning process around every one of these different pieces, but I think they're good questions to elevate uh, as well. Right, and the actual programming was not part of their study, so that's why right. she's looking. But yes, we, if we get to move forward on Cox, that's the kind of details that we would then go into at that point. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> and to the question earlier on the habitable area, something like a grocery store um, is that kind of, um, can, can probably serve that kind of need. And okay. so um, maybe looking at the lower levels of a parking deck uh -huh. as something that serves those kinds of things really starts to integrate um, that a little bit. Thanks. Okay. Yeah.
Um, well, I guess one other just high level question. I mean, there's a, there's this proposal is all about facilities and thinking ahead and you know contemplating pretty major expansions of a lot of facilities. Is there any way to kind of just sort of ballpark? You know, if you if you if you build your if you build out larger facilities in these ways, and I realize in a few places, if you just implemented the plan as proposed, there would be some efficiencies and some savings by closing some of the smaller facilities, but or consolidating them. So, but but I, I assume there would be like a bigger operating cost, right? These are much larger facilities than what Buncombe County operates today by you know orders of magnitude. So as we um, talk further about this, then it might be also helpful to um, just kind of get some like, you know, benchmarks of if you build facilities of this size, then, you know, be prepared that, you know, your operating costs are going to be more in these neighborhoods than, you know, than where they've traditionally been. So. Mm -hmm. And we would hope that we're building building with new technology, that they're not 1960s buildings. So hopefully some of the utility costs and some of our lead certified that we will put into these buildings will help drive some of that utility cost <clears> down. <throat> And then we have staff that is so stretched out that maybe that we can consolidate some of that staff. So we can look at that savings or expense, additional expense, but we were hoping that the buildings that we have now are so old and have used so much utilities that we could try but some they, of that. There down. would be a lot more staffing under this plan than what we have today, right? In if, fifth, if it's all built if you, out if in you 50. built out all these like, yes. libraries that are you know, two, two to three times as large as what we have today, yes. you would staff them yes. at a much higher level, Yes. I'm assuming. Yes. I actually have one more question. I'm sorry. If if the la if the PAC location were to move, what's the vision for PAC, the current PAC location? We've talked about that as that would be property that could go back on the market for new housing downtown or whatever, but it would be something that we will look to talk to you guys about as surplus property. So that's a county-owned building that yes. would be going mm -hmm. online. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, just the last thing I would share is just you know, I think there are lots of good ideas here. Um, you know, when I think about it at a high level, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of stuff in here I think that we should, you know, I'm, you know, conceptually supportive of. You know, I do, I, um, I think part of the reason proposals like this that think big and think long term are helpful is that it kind of raises the questions about like, okay, you know, like what are our, what are our, our highest priorities, right? So uh, I like a lot of what's in here. And when you think about the next 10 to 15 years though, you know, there are a lot of other priorities too. And so, you know, I mean, I think when I think about Buncombe County over the next 10 to 15 years, I'd like to see us like, you know what we're doing at Lee Walker Heights, you know, with replacing our oldest public housing with like a completely different kind of much more integrated neighborhood that I think is gonna thrive in a way that uh, is, is I, think, I think we need to do that at every public housing development in Buncombe County. And that's gonna be like a huge lift to do that, right? Financially and otherwise, but transforming those neighborhoods I think is one of the most important things that we can do to really make our community better over the next 10 to 15 years. And so, you know, as we think about this important department in the county, we also need to think about how it, you know, how it fits into our other priorities as well. Because it is, this is, this would be a big, you know, this would be a big, a big commitment. It would be funding at a higher level. Um, and there's a lot to it that I think is, is, is great. But, um, you know, I think it's just we have to we have to think about all those different priorities as we contemplate these kind of commitments. Because if we approve this plan, you know, whatever whatever plan we do approve, you know, as we will remember from our friends in East Asheville, like people will remember it. Like people will say, <laughs> if you did, if you say you're going to do this, you know, you better be prepared to do it. So I think we, um, you know, we have to take all of that really seriously because the community is really interested in in all of this. So. Anyway, just to say thank you for all your work on this. I think it's uh, this is really good planning, and I think it's going to um, elevate a lot of important conversations around it. Any Those lockers comments? might be a perfect opportunity for the the housing projects that you're talking about too, to be able to integrate some of the libraries with the. Yeah, you know, um, I, I again, I, I think the downtown property is definitely a place where we should look at doing something, you know, potentially significant. Um, and, um, you know, our affordable housing subcommittee has been looking at, at how to scale up our work in these areas. Um, and I don't want to get into all the weeds on that, but there's, there's a lot of significant opportunities there. Um, so anyway, look forward to talking further about all that. All right. Um, Avril, is there anything else we need to address during the briefing? All right. Then I think we are adjourned and we will be back at five o'clock.